Oh, I realized it was more intricate. I didn't realize I couldn't put it together. It was more intricate than I had thought it would be. Okay, and based on what? Based upon the fact that it was supposed to be a few parts, and I thought it was a few too many parts. What steps did you take to actually try to build it? I didn't take any because I wasn't ready to write that story yet. You, you decided to write that story months prior? Yes. Um, but you weren't ready to start writing it? That's right. So what was the need to buy the gun at that point? I was celebrating it was Christmas. Right. right. But what was the need to buy the gun if you weren't writing the story yet? Mr. Overstreet, we have had testimony upon testimony upon testimony about the fact Dan was a collector. Dan didn't, wasn't a collector by himself. I had my little piles of stuff. You know, uh, what I found, <laughs> what I have found in life is if you see something you want it, you can afford it, buy it now because circling back for it, it may or may not be there. And so now you're a gun collector? No. Now I have a piece of writing information research. <coughs> Did you, you, you said you didn't take any steps to try to build this gun. I did not. And I want to show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 25. Do you, first of all, do you recognize this? Yes. Do you recognize all the parts in here? Well, you're further away than I would say, but certainly it looks like all the parts are there. Is this what it looked like when you got it? Yes. Approximately. Approximately. And you saw this part in the kit? I did. Was there anything you needed to do to this to make it functional? I hadn't gotten that deep into this gun. I'm not sure how to answer that question because the answer is I don't know. Did, was there anything in the instructions or anything you saw online that made you think you needed to manipulate this part? And once again, I go back to I don't know because there are a slew of parts, you know. Uh, the only thing I can attribute it to is when you buy an IKEA thing, there are pieces that come fairly close together, and that isn't where you celebrate. You celebrate the little bags of all, you don't celebrate the little bag. Let me say this sentence again where it makes sense. You're delighted to see pieces more or less together. All the little parts, you're less delighted to see. Yeah. Is this why you never even opened these little baggies? I wasn't ready to start yet. I didn't want them misplaced. Okay. So you made no attempts to try to build it. You didn't do any further research because you weren't ready to write this story? That's right. Thank you. Your defense attorney stated in opening that you knew or that you thought you knew that Nathaniel uh, had previously done a build kit. Yes. You knew that or thought that at least. I thought he had said that and I believed him. Uh, when you have this story to do a gun build kit and you actually when you purchased a gun build kit, you didn't ever talk to Nathaniel about his experience with a build kit. No, and that wouldn't have been where I would have gone with that. Where I would have gone first would be to my father-in-law, Jack, who I knew had every equipment in the world and could help me drill out the parts that needed to be drilled out. Okay, but you didn't do that either? No, because I wasn't ready to start yet. And how did you know you needed a drill press? Because it was on one of the videos. One of the videos? Uh-huh. How many did you watch? I don't know. Why were you watching videos if you weren't writing the story yet? I was watching videos to see how to put it together. But I thought you weren't ready to put it together. I'm not ready to put it together, but that doesn't mean I'm not researching what I have to do to get it ready to get put together. Okay, so now you're doing research online. We have stated previously, and I am not backing down from that, that I investigated, investigated, investigated. One of my friends has a sign over her desk that says, only James Michener gets to use all his research. You research everything to maybe come up with six sentences in a book that will make the book more realistic. So, you, yeah, you, I do tons of research. You do a lot of research. I do. So I'm just having a hard time 
having that make sense with what you said about planning and, and preparing. Dan was a better planner than I was. Hang on. Let me sorry. ask you a question. I'm so sorry. You said yesterday that you're not a planner. Did you say but that? I did say that, but but let me put a caveat on that. Please. I am not a I am not a planner in the initial stages the way Dan was, but you know, I'm fair rare. I rarely go into anything willy nilly, and I rarely <clears throat> do anything that I don't complete. Uh, States Exhibit 82 shows that you were doing some of your research, uh -huh. uh, maybe, um, on February 1st. You were searching for gun shops at that time. I'm not sure what State Exhibit uh, 82 is. Okay, it was your uh, internet, some of your internet history. Okay. Um, it was showed to you yesterday by your counsel and asked to you by your counsel about February 1st and you're searching for gun shops in Portland. What were you searching for? That was different. I wasn't researching that. When I'm looking for gun shops in Portland, it was not for gun pieces. At this point, it's on a whole different conversation. That's writing and that's a little cubicle in and of itself in my life. What Dan and I were talking about was, did we need to own a gun at this point? And while we had both been adamant uh, anti-gun people for a long time, the last three or four years had changed how we felt about that. And we were discussing it and had been discussing it for well over a year. So as what was described yesterday as a left-leaning individual, yes, your response to gun violence in the country was to buy a gun. In 2017, one of the uh, memes uh, of the left was, uh, if we continue to be anti-guns, does that mean that everybody in the country who will own a gun but the people on the left? And it was a serious concern. Lots and lots and lots of people were changing their ideas about gun ownership because the country had become so diversified. Well, Ms. Profi, I appreciate a meme as well and what other people's opinions might be, but I'm asking your position as somebody who is so anti-gun, so anti-gun, in fact, that your law enforcement husband wasn't allowed to have a gun in the house. No. Hang on. Sorry. So anti-gun, but your response to gun violence increasing in this country was to buy a gun yourself. Yes or no? Yes, with a caveat. At what point from the time you received this ghost gun to June 2nd, did you decide that you were not going to use it? That we're speaking now of the gun that we bought at the gun show. No. Oh, all right. Ask me the question again, please. This ghost gun that I just showed right. you. What point did you decide you were not going to use it? I never decided I was not going to use it. Is that why you kept it? I kept it because eventually I was going to put it together and write the story. And you decided oh. the way to keep it would be to put it in a box with scarves and purses and store it in storage. No. What I decided was to store it away until I reached the point that I would do it. But I was trying to get moved at that point. Certainly there was, you know, I didn't see another big option there. And I even marked the box because at any point I expected the police to come back to me and say things like, does Dan have a computer? Do you all have a computer? Can we look at any of this? Do you all have anything else? So I marked it so I could find it again. That was for the police benefit. That wasn't for mine. Oh, oh. I marked the box that I packed that it had a gun kit in it because I thought sooner or later the police are going to come back to me and the police never once talked to me after that. Did you literally just say that was for the police's benefit? That was literally what I said. I marked the box for the police's benefit so that I could find it again when the police came back. For and what? I, well, I sort of thought that if the police didn't find something, they would want to come back and re-interview and I would be able to show them things. I thought the fact that all they had was Dan's uh, phone and not a computer premise 
might not had they may have reached a dead end and said mrs brophy is there anything you can give us that would help any electronic equipment anything else so i was kind of in my mind making a list i at that point silly me since i believed i didn't kill my husband i didn't think i was a uh with a uh serious uh suspect despite you telling people that you were i told people i was a suspect because it's always wife so you lost me there for a minute. Um, let's circle back. You said something about computers. Right. I didn't ask anything about computers. I'm asking about a gun. You're asking why I was marking things for the police. I and did that... not ask you that. Okay. Maybe that's where I got a little lost. Um, okay. You said that you marked that box for the police benefit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you thought that was important to the police that they might want this gun kit. I had a hard time believing that I would be interviewed by the police for 45 minutes. We would have a brief conversation on the telephone and I would never hear from them again till the case was solved. I thought for sure the police would come back and say, is there anything else you've got that could help us? And that would have included the gun kit. Let's you make know. this easier. What is the relevance of this gun kit to the police? None, but we had it. You know, I figured they'd ask for it sooner or later. Why would the police ask you for a gun kit that they don't know that you own? What I, I'm failing to understand what your rationale was for making this available to the police. You think it's so important to them that at some point they're going to come ask for it, but you don't call them. I figured the police were doing the police job the way the police did it, that they probably did not need. I will be the first to tell you, I got my detective's license on TV, and I can guarantee you I had ideas on how this case should have gone. But I sort of figured the police had more experience, and they were the ones in charge. So you think you have relevant evidence to a, a murder investigation, and you don't think you should mention it to the police? How does a gun kit? Even though I marked it, how is a gun kit relative evidence? I'm asking you. I'm asking you because I don't think it is because it's never been put together. Then so, why would you mark it for the police? Because I figured the police would come back and want to know. What, what else did you think was relevant to the police investigation that you marked and did not share with them? I, I thought they would want, eventually want to know about the computers. They thought they would eventually want to go through the computers and see what they could uh, find, if anything, that would help them. And did you give them a, a computer that belonged to Dan? No. We had a computer. They never asked for it. But in my mind, I knew they would eventually, if they didn't solve the case by somebody coming in and confessing, they would eventually come back and say, can we see your computer? My computers weren't packed because... I thought they were relevant to the police if the police wanted to go in that direction. Well, that's not exactly true, right? I mean, you had a computer in storage. No, I had a computer in a box in one room and a computer by the bed in another room. That's not in storage. Right, one in a box in your room. What about the one that was in the storage unit? There was not a computer in storage. So there wasn't a laptop in the storage unit? There was not. Okay. What your testimony, what your guys' testimony was, they found the computer in a bedroom and they found the computer in a box in the other, in, in the, what had been the office. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would agree then that the stuff that was found on the computer that has been shown here in court was on the computer that was packed away in a box? Uh, I think that's how they, they did it, but... You know, we were the two computers. Why did you get a new computer in March of 2018? When you open the computer, the old computer, you can't read the screen because it's become lines across it. So you did all your research of all these guns on one computer, then packed that away and put it in a box in the closet, and then you got a new computer. Is that right? I get a new computer every year. I take a computer with me when I go out to the fields. I beat a computer up. I buy a fairly inexpensive computer because I know I'm replacing it the next year. And you thought the police would want that, but you didn't give it to them. The police never contacted me again. I assumed that they were doing their job and didn't want my interference. So you told your friends 
uh, in this car ride. That was in February, right? To one of them, yes. The one where you're telling Darla Lukenbaugh about the fact that you bought this gun kit? Yes. And at that point, you had already bought State's Exhibit 26, the full gun from the gun show, correct? If I hadn't bought it, I was close to buying it. I'm not sure the exact date of the car ride in February. In fact, you had not only bought this gun during that car ride, but you were actively bidding on the slide and barrel. Isn't that right? Yes, probably. If it was after the 15th of February that we did this. And we'll get to the slide and barrel in a minute, but your testimony and your, what your defense has asserted in their opening statements was that you bought that slide and barrel for writing. That's true. But you didn't tell your friends about the slide and barrel. I was more on the story than I was on the gun kit. Right. You would agree that you never told law enforcement that you owned this ghost gun kit? No, because this ghost gun kit, despite the fact you refer to it as a weapon on a regular basis, is not a weapon unless I hit somebody over the head with the case. There's nothing about that gun kit that's a gun, except that if you spend a few hours and put it together, it could be a gun. But I've got eggs and uh, flour in my uh, pantry, and that's not an omelet either until you uh, put it together. And you would agree that you also never told the police about the slide and barrel that um, you purchased on, e e on eBay? Mr. Overstreet, when I talked to the police, when I talked to the police in June, they asked me specific questions. My husband had just died. The fact that I was coherent at all is a miracle. The fact that they never came back to me after that for a follow-up interview, I think thought was shocking. You know, I thought this was on the police. This wasn't on me. The police said, we're handling this. You just go home and rest. You know, you go home and take it one day at a time, you know. And they never contacted me again, except for the things that I they asked me for, which was Dan's schedule. I got that to them, and I was having trouble with their email, but I did what I was asked to do. Are you declining to answer my question? Perhaps not. What was your question? That was a lengthy answer for not remembering my question. Well, I go off on tangents. So I asked you, is it true that you did not tell the police about the slide and barrel? It is true. I did not tell the police about the slide okay. and barrel. The slide and barrel that fit, would fit perfectly on the gun show gun that you purchased. The slide and barrel that I was using for research for my writing. I did not tell them about that. You can answer that question? I did. I said I did not tell them. Would you agree that it fit on the gun? That you bought from the gun. It was the same thing. It could have been interchanged, yes. So although you owned, well, we'll get to that in just a second. When exactly did you put the ghost gun in storage? Somewhere between June 2nd and uh, September 5th when I was arrested. I have no idea. Uh, how big was your property? We had half an acre. Half an acre. You're sure of that? I'm positive of that. Got some conflicting testimonies you might remember. Yes, yes, but it was testimony from a woman who lived in an apartment who thought any amount of lawn was going to be huge. Okay. You so know. you had a half an acre. Yes. And it's true that that, <coughs> that lot behind your house was not five acres, right? It was actually just about an acre. It could have been slightly larger. I think, I think I've seen the plot, and it was something like 1.3, but that's been a long time ago, and I could be wrong. You talk about the interview with the police and how that that was uh, you just found out your husband died and it's very hard to remember everything that you talked about in there. Mm -hmm. But you didn't you do recall that you didn't have any trouble telling them about the firearm that you had purchased at the gun show, correct? In fact you told them the whole story about why and how you purchased the gun. Detective Merrill said, Does Dan have any guns? Dan owned half a block. I told him about the full block. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic here, although I thought listening to that sentence, it came out snotty, which wasn't really the way I wanted it to come out. But what I will tell you is he asked me, I answered him the best way I knew how. Why didn't you just say, yes, we have a gun? I was trying to be helpful to the police at this point so they would know what was going on. You know, at this point, I thought they were going to find my husband the killer. I didn't think they were going to say, let's look at the one person who didn't kill him. But instead of just answering, yes, we have a gun, 
and it's at home, you actually made sure to give them a full story as to how and why you purchased that gun. Mr. Overstreet, you are having trouble keeping me quiet now because I tell stories as I'm talking to you. Do you think I was less than that with the police when I'm upset? This is how I talk. I tell full stories to illustrate what I'm saying. Even though you were just informed of your husband's murder? Well, apparently it didn't make me quieter. It just made me more upset. And you paid cash for that gun? Yes, we did. Your attorney made a, uh, a big deal out of you purchasing things with your debit card or credit card. Right. Why would you pay cash at the gun show? Well, actually, that was Stan's idea. And uh, when we talked about it and what have you, he said, here's 400 in cash. Uh, you get cash from your thing. So if I went on Dan's idea on that. Didn't you actually withdraw the $400? I withdrew the $400, but it was he gave me 400 in addition, and he gave me cash. Okay, I don't know that I quite understand that. Didn't you withdraw $400 from your on-point account? After he had given me the first 400 How did he give you 400 In cash. Where did that come from? Dan has cash at the house. Dan owns, operates a cash business. You know, he sells eggs. He sells a crack on the cart. He sells, um, he operates with a lot of cash. Okay, so he gave you, and we'll talk about that too. Um, so he gives you $400. Uh -huh. You then go to On Point and uh -huh. withdraw $400. Uh -huh. So you have $800 cash. I do. What did you do with the remaining 300 Well, it wasn't a remaining 300 uh, as they were taking the gun apart to show me how it worked, they sold me, uh, but I didn't have a receipt on it, they showed, sold me uh, some oil that I they thought I was going to need. And in addition, I had bought a book on Glocks in general. So uh, what did I do with the probably 200 plus, but not much plus? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I gave part back to Dan. That was a long time ago. It wasn't that essential to me. I have no memory of what I did with it. You didn't put it back in your bank account? Maybe Dan and I went out to dinner. Who knows? You know, but I could have just as easily given it back to Dan. Okay. Told uh, detectives, and I believe you testified to this as well, that you got home with that gun. Mm -hmm. and uh, looked at it, mm -hmm. thought it was heavy, <coughs> ugly, some other maybe descriptive terms you used, I'm not quite sure right now, um, but you realized you didn't want it. You and Dan both realized you didn't want it. I think we were both ambivalent about it still. Mm -hmm. This didn't really solve the problem, but I think we went back and forth for months before we bought it and for weeks after we bought it. So you didn't decide you didn't want it that day. That's right. Got it home. You took it. Did you handle it? Oh, sure. We both did. What did you do to handle it? Well, you know, we pulled it out and we looked at it. And, I mean, how would I have known it was heavy if I hadn't held it? Uh, you know. Uh, and, you know, somebody testified earlier that there were two little dark hairs that were in the slide. In our house, who had two little short, dark hairs was not me. You know, that would have been Dan. Uh, he handled it. Um, did you see him handle it? Yeah, it was right there. And what did he do with it? He looked at it. He picked it up. He messed with it. He pointed it toward the backyard. So, you know, even though it had no bullets in it. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't recall. We had a great conversation about it, but he definitely handled it. Did you ever remove the sliding barrel? Oh, sure, I played with it. Oh, you did remove the sliding barrel? Sure. Oh. I didn't think that was a secret. Well, you didn't tell the police that. The police didn't ask me whether I'd remove the sliding barrel. You told the police that you got it home and that you realized how much you didn't want it and you put it away and never touched it again. Do you remember that? I could have said that, but I was upset at the time, so that was probably an exaggeration. Uh, I handled the gun, you know. <laughs> I may not have loved it, but I was still curious about it. And keep in mind, I'm writing a story about a gun, and I need to research guns so I can have it. But yes, I didn't, you know, I touched the gun. Yeah. And so your testimony today, after hearing all the testimony and seeing all the evidence on the screen, your testimony today is that you have removed that sliding barrel. I have. 
So you know how to do it. Yeah. It's not that hard, right? Oh, it's terribly hard. Oh. I broke two nails doing it. Don't believe them when they say it's not that hard. You can't just whip it off the way they do it. You have to hold the gun a certain way. You have to pull it back. I broke two nails pulling it back. And I thought, this isn't any fun. And uh, it, you would be shocked at how hard it is to do. You know, yeah, if you've hand, handled guns all your life, I'm sure it's a piece of cake. But I can tell you, for me, it was not. So you remove the sliding barrel. Yes. You can see that it's nearly identical to the ghost gun sliding barrel, correct? I'd have to look at both of them now, but I would say yes. Let's do that. Oh, yeah, we can look at... Okay. I'm not going to hand these to you. I'm just going to show them to you. Yes. Do you agree that these look nearly identical? I would agree that they look identical, but they obviously are not. One of them is quite a bit longer than the other one. Quite a bit longer. Which makes them not identical. When you're circling the little things on which find five things in this picture that aren't identical, you would circle them. Right. This one is slightly shorter. Yes. Clock 19, Joe's gun. <laughs> what else is not identical about this gun? Well, one. One of them obviously has a uh, zip tie on it, but they are similar, is what I would say, but they are not identical. Can you see the back? Yes. I agree they're similar. Can you see the top? I agree they're similar. I'm not going to point this at you, but can you see the, the barrel? I can. Okay. Anything about this side that is not exactly the same? I would ask you this, as you're demonstrating this, does it fit on the other gun? No. Does that make it not identical? Yes. You knew it didn't fit, right? I knew it didn't fit because I uh, knew that I had a book on Glocks, and in order for a Glock to work, it had to work the right way. You knew it didn't fit, and then you bought a sliding barrel that wouldn't fit the gun show gun, right? No, I bought a sliding barrel that was the same one. I could have easily bought one that fit the uh, ghost gun, but I did not. I bought this one. Why would you buy another sliding barrel to fit the ghost gun when you couldn't build it? You already own it. You own this piece right here. You own this. Yes. So why would you buy another one? Uh, you know, if a trigger had been available, I would have bought a trigger. I'm telling you, I was fascinated with gun pieces at that point because I was writing a story on gun pieces and making it into a gun. There's a trigger in this kit. Yes, and I would have bought another one if I'd had it. I figured if I could construct them together the way the uh, character would have, it would have worked fine. But, Miss Brophy, you didn't buy other gun pieces. You bought a sliding barrel that would fit this gun. That's true. No other pieces did you buy? No, but I wasn't finished shopping either. You were worried. You, your counsel said this. I don't know if you believe it or, or agree with it, but I'm going to ask you. You needed to buy that sliding barrel because you were worried about taking this gun apart? Yes. Okay. But you just testified that you took the sliding barrel off of it. That's not taking the gun apart. We're talking about if we took the slide and bar the sliding barrel itself completely apart, could I put it back together and have a gun that wouldn't backfire on me and kill me? You know, and so the fact that when I said to Dan, I can take this gun, the real gun, not the kit and play the gun, apart, and it'll help me do this. Dan said, no, 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 no. I've seen you in action. That's a mistake. Let's keep it together. We may get to sell it. I'm not talking about taking the entire gun apart. Okay. I'm talking about the sliding barrel. Yes. A critical piece of information, as you know now, if you didn't know before this trial, you know now the sliding barrel is what is what it, is that issue, right? Yes. We keep talking about the gun and taking it apart and all that. We're talking about the sliding barrel. Uh -huh. You have a gun complete, uh -huh. sliding barrel intact. You know how to remove it. In fact, you did. Uh -huh. You can manipulate the sliding barrel separate and apart from the rest of the gun. Uh -huh. But you chose to buy 
the exact same piece. Is that right? Yes, but I have a caveat on that too. Of course. Go ahead. The caveat I have on that was I wasn't thinking, hey, uh, this would work that way. I was thinking because for me, the gun was the gun, the toy was the toy, the pieces were the toy. I'm not talking about the ghost gun, Ms. Ropey. We're talking about the difference between the slide and the barrel. I'm not talking about the ghost gun. Okay. I thought when you said caveat that you're going to explain to us why in the world, when you already own this exact piece, you would need to buy another one days later? Within days. What I can tell you is it was for writing. It was not to, uh, as you would have it, murder my husband. Why isn't this for writing? What's the difference? Are you tapping the ghost gun or are you tapping the, uh, uh, the full gun? That isn't for writing because that isn't the story. Here, Your Honor, at this me. point, if counsel's going to be aggressive, I would ask that he not have Explain to me what the difference is. Okay, hold on a sec. I, I, I'm going to allow him to, to hold the gun. Explain to me what the difference is between this piece right here that I'm pointing to, the uh -huh. slide barrel that you removed yourself, uh -huh. and the one that you bought on eBay. I thought we just went through that. You're telling me you couldn't use this for writing? No. That was the end piece. That was for protection. The other was for research. <clears throat> so at this point, you spent over $1,000 in guns and gun parts. Uh -huh. Is that right? Uh-huh. By the time you buy the eBay slide and barrel, your upwards around fifteen hundred dollars. About. About. Your uh, attorney seemed to indicate that you happened upon the eBay slide and barrel. Yes. It was just a pop-up ad. No, it wasn't a pop-up ad. That's what she said. Well, if that's what she said. Then I probably said that to her at one point or another, but it wasn't something that uh, the slide and barrel was a. Is that? Ah, sorry. Uh, I didn't happen upon it. At the point that I decided I wanted to do this, I tend to be impulsive, and I bought it because I wanted it. Where is it? I have no idea. If you'd asked me on the day of my arrest, I would have told you that it was either in the house or it was either in storage. I haven't seen it for months and months and months and months. So. And you just bought it in February and got it at the very last day of February, right? February 28th? Could be. I don't know. I mean, I'm not looking at my numbers, notes. You didn't lose this gun. No. You didn't lose the gun kit. The gun kit went to the police. The, the gun went to the police. I didn't have to worry about packing that. Miss Brophy, I'm talking about the time leading up to the murder. Oh, all right. No, I knew where it was. You knew where the ghost gun was? It was on the floor of my closet. You knew where that gun was? Yes. And I would tell you that the slide was on the floor of my closet next to the ghost gun. Sitting on the floor? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Just like literally sitting on the floor. Well, it wasn't in the middle. It was tech talk. It was tucked behind, next to, rather than behind, next to an armoire I had in the closet. Okay. When's the last time you saw it? That's what I was saying. I can't remember. I have no idea when the last time I saw it was. I know that I messed with it in February. I know I messed with it in March, but I can't remember seeing it after that. Why didn't you make an attempt to locate it and mark it for the police like you did the ghost gun? I stumbled across the ghost gun when I was packing. That's why I marked the box. 
in my mind, I had a list of things I thought the police might come back and ask me for, and I thought the ghost gun would be among them. Do you see the irony in not being able to locate that and that being the allegation that that was the murder weapon? You know, I see nothing ironic about this case at all. I see nothing happy about this case at all. <coughs> You're aware that the police searched your storage unit? I am. Your pods? Yes. Your house? Yes. You're aware that they even opened up your appliances inside your house to search for... I was junk. not aware of that. Okay. You would agree that you've previously written about hiding weapons inside appliances, correct? One of your books? Maybe, but I don't remember that. Okay. Are you aware that they even opened up a wall to search for a gun? Yes, they did it after the house went into uh, eight months. After the, they had gotten the search warrant, they went back with a new search warrant just before it closed. So they, they did all that searching. Mm-hmm. Got the ghost gun. Mm-hmm. Couldn't find the sliding barrel from eBay. Mm-hmm. But you stored a lot of stuff in your niece's basement, didn't you? I did. But the stuff I stored in my niece's basement happened after uh, the police were finished with the house. That was everything that was at the end. So the police had either looked at it or they hadn't. Mm -hmm. You didn't store anything <laughs> anywhere else before your arrest? No. And you're sure that nothing went to your niece's house? I'm positive nothing went to my niece's house after, until after. Oh, wait, wait, let me back up just a minute because there's a fact here. <clears throat> Susan had left some clothes. For a while, they had uh, been at uh, Sarah's house before Dan died. And I'm going to say maybe as long as a year before Dan died, I went and got all the boxes that Susan had left and put them in our storage building. So that when Susan came, I was able to give those to her sister, and she took them home. So I have had things stored at Sarah's house in the past. You know, like you just said, that the police were very interested in the sliding barrel for me then, right? I know that from the testimony and from the hearings we've had. You have the discovery. I have the discovery. Here, I have a matter for the court. All right, let's uh, let's have the uh, jury step out for just one minute. You're running all right for the jury. <clears throat> I need to stay. All right, everyone, you can see it. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ms. Maxwell. Yes, Your Honor. I, I, I am worried that we are headed in a direction where counsel is going to ask my client about what the police, what kind of evidence the police wanted and why after her arrest she didn't produce a sliding barrel to the police. And I would make uh, a Fifth Amendment argument against that. It, if we're going to go down that road about whether she didn't voluntarily produce evidence after her arrest, I have serious concerns about that and would make an objection. And just I don't so understand the objection, the what type of evidence? We've heard testimony that she doesn't know what happened to the slide and barrel. Um, I think what counsel, the direction counsel went is you knew that the slide and barrel was important to the police. You knew that from reading the discovery. And I anticipate the next question is, even after reading in the discovery, that the police were very concerned about finding the slide and barrel, you did not produce it. Now, I know that she's already answered the question in the fact that she said, I have no idea where the darn slide and barrel is, but, but at this point, if we're going to pursue a line of questioning about what evidence she must produce or, or the jury should think she must produce post-arrest, I think is wrong. And I think it violates her, her rights not to even have ju a jury make an adverse inference regarding the production of evidence. 
Well, let me ask, what, what was the question, what was the line of questioning going to be? I'm going to ask her about why she didn't, well, I, I, I don't want to disclose the question, Your Honor. Before. Okay, all right. It's well, not I that. Mean, I can tell you that. I, I, he, here's where, where I'm at. Um, so she is testifying. She's not remaining silent. And she's already answered the question about what became of the slide and barrel. Um, I, I'm not totally sure where the state is going with this line of questioning. Uh, so I, at this point, I'm overruling the objection. But Ms. Maxfield, depending on what the state asks, uh, feel free to raise it again. But at this point, I think it's fair game to, to ask about what she knew. And I don't know if she knew or didn't know what the state's about to ask, because I'm not quite sure what the state's going to ask. And I, I will say, Your Honor, I'm not asking why she didn't give it to the police. She's already said she didn't know where it was. I already have that answer. Are, are you asking questions about her refusing to produce other evidence? Or, I mean, can you give me a general idea? I know you, you don't want her to hear the question in advance, but I'm just trying to get a, an idea of the theme. Not, it is not her refusal to produce evidence. Okay. That is not my line. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's bring the jury back in. Well, since it's, I will go ahead and take the jury and you can go off her. Please be seated. I overruled the objections. So, Mr. Overstreet, you can ask the next question. Um, Ms. Brophy, I'm going to come back uh, to that in a minute. 
Um, but I believe your answer was that you did have the discovery, you reviewed it. Yes. Okay. And you, you do realize or did realize that this slide barrel that was outstanding was a, a central issue in this case. Yes, probably uh, eight months after my arrest, I realized that. Okay. And you understand that today? Yes. Now, you've testified, um, well, we've heard different things uh, from, your, from your interview with the police and what you've said on the stand that you sort of hated guns, you didn't like them, but then you became interested in them for writing, then for safety. Um, and then you seem to have taken quite an interest after that in, in guns. Is, is that safe to say? I would say the irony is that we bought a gun to protect us, and it didn't protect us. I'm just asking about your interest in guns. My interest in guns were twofold. One is the protection, which it didn't work, and second is the writing, which has nothing to do with guns, but has to do with gun pieces. Right. But you said you became obsessed with firearms. I was, I was obsessed with the writing and the gun pieces, not with firearms. You know, I wasn't investigating AR-15s or shotguns or anything like that. Just Glocks? Just a handgun that would protect my character. And you did a lot of research online? Not yet. <coughs> I started it. So you... Didn't you just testify, like... That I started researching, that I research online all the time, but I, w I wasn't finished researching by any stretch of the imagination. You had been to a gun show? <clears throat> yes. Bought a gun? Yes. Bought a ghost gun? Went through that whole process? Right. Uh, when did you go to the gun range? I never have been to a gun range. Never been to a gun range. So you're doing this research. You're getting ready to do this writing. You have all these people around you that know about guns and own guns and have maybe even done some research themselves for their own books. Mm -hmm. uh, why didn't you ever talk to Nathaniel about guns? I have talked to Nathaniel about guns. There was a point I was writing a story early on, and I told him I needed a gun, uh, a type of gun that I could have my uh, hero use, and he gave me the name and explained why. When was that? Well, you know, it was probably, uh, it was probably uh, 2010. It was, it had been a while before. So in 2018, 2017, 2018, you had known for years that Nathaniel had knowledge about guns. Yes, but, <clears throat> sorry. Did you talk to Dan's brothers about guns? That he, they owned them, oh. or at least Bill owned them. And uh, did you talk to Tanya Medlin and her husband about guns? Apparently Dan talked to him more than I did, but yeah. And Terry Reed? No, I don't think Terry Reed and I discussed guns at all. You, what about your other writer friends, including Jesse Smith? Jesse Smith, salute. Uh, I probably talked briefly to Linda Smith, but I knew how she felt. Uh, and Linda Smith does not write that kind of a story anyway. Why didn't you talk to Matt Gitchell about guns? Well, I didn't know that he was an authority. Why not follow up with Tony Hall, who you knew was an authority? Tony Hall was really Dan's friend. I mean, I knew him, but I never ran into him. Why didn't you do any research at the gun show or, or go to a gun store and talk to them? Because I wasn't ready to write the story yet. Oh. That would have come. In fact, the, the company that you bought the gun through j and Firearms. Uh -huh. That's actually a gun store that's very close to your house, right? It turned out to be, yeah. They had recommended that you go to uh, Threat Dynamics or that gun range that we've uh -huh. seen a couple of times. Uh, you never went to the Threat Dynamics? Never. You've never gone to the Tri-County Gun Club? Is that the one that we keep talking about out on 26? No. Oh, well, no, I've never been there. Where were you going on the 26th when you were out near that gun range? Oh, on the two random days in March that we've been talking about off and on? 
Is that what you're asking me about now? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dan and I had decided that that was an area we wanted to look at. I'm driving around frequently out there trying to look to see if there's any property, anything that leaps out at us, anything that is all the requirements Dan has. The land has to be flat for gardening. The land has to be fairly treeless so that we don't have the shadow hanging over it. I know what he requires, and I know what I need in the house. Isn't you that know? state land out there? It is after fashion, and that's why I didn't go all the way out to where you're saying it was. I went out after fashion, came back. You just drove out there randomly, were there less than a couple of minutes, and then headed back to Portland? On no, I didn't, I didn't do any of the... Wait, let's stop. But ask your question to me again, and let me see if I On the 26th, I the first day, I believe okay. it was Monday. Right. Uh, while Dan was at work. Right. Uh, you drove out to that area. Right. And according to cell site location information, it appears that you drove out there, turned around, and drove back. I don't think I drove that far out there. I mean, you know, I don't, I, if, I know that it's out there. I know because we've talked about it and talked about it and talked about it, but I have never, ever, ever been there. And if I had been going there, I would have gone there with Dan, and I would have gone there with... We ended up at the closest I got to it. We had, what, two minutes, ten minutes that I could have spent there? I can think if I was just going out to fire a gun at dirt that I could have found someplace a whole lot closer to my house than driving an hour and a half to make that happen. So you knew about that gun range? I had heard about the gun range from the J&B people. In fact, that's your handwriting, right? On I don't the... know. I haven't seen that note in ages. Receipt. So you knew it was there, though. And I'm not sure that is my handwriting, so I'm thinking about it. I think they wrote it down. Okay. But, but I can look at the note again and tell you. Let's not get lost in the weeds here. Okay. You know about the gun range. They I told knew you about, about the gun range. It. Your car just happens to be out in that area on the 26th. I'm sorry, your phone happens to be out in that area on the 26th. And what I can tell you is Delilah Marvell's property is west of Banks. Vernonia is northwest the area dan wanted to look in is this area and we i was looking you know and i can tell you we've been looking for a while you'll see if you went back and looked at my uh my uh locations at the kiosk i frequently was in that area looking once again property what would work you know you'll see, i'm all over town now to be perfectly honest I don't remember doing any of this, but I'm sure I did it. And since you brought it up so often, I have seriously thought about it. But all I can tell you is it wasn't a day where I thought, whoa, this will be new and different. This was just a day. And I'm assuming the reason I'm driving around out there in that area is to, because I look for property. This is not a situation where I have a clear memory of it. This is a situation where if I was out there on two random days in March, then what was happening was I was probably looking for property. And that is my best guess. Didn't you have lunch with someone that day? I could have. I don't remember. In Portland? I have no idea. I, I mean, let's go back. Let's look at the records. I can probably reconstruct. But uh, where does it say I had lunch? Didn't you go to Nicholas's restaurant in Northeast Portland on Broadway on the 26th? Okay, I could have. That sound familiar? I go there frequently. I have a friend who really likes to go there, and and we frequently meet and talk about riding there. And who who were you meeting there? Oh well, uh, it's somebody who hasn't testified. It's a woman named Marilyn Hill. Marilyn Hull. Okay. Hull. H U L L. So on the twenty sixth, you uh -huh. get up, you Google how to load a Glock nine millimeter. Uh huh. You drive out to an area that. Wait, wait. I don't know that I Googled that, but if you say I did, I'd I'd like to see that. But I could have. I mean, once again, I am, I am messing with gun pieces, you know. I am not messing with uh, research. I am not messing with uh, – so I could have put that in that morning if I had some spare time because I don't think I gave up the gun research until the beginning of April when I knew I had to get back and finish my other story. Part of the problem is, is if you don't finish the story you're on, 
then you have story pieces everywhere. And, you know, people say, what's the most difficult thing about writing a book? It's finishing the book. You have to force yourself to finish it. When you've written yourself into a hole, it's real easy to see a new idea out there that would be more interesting. You have to go back and force yourself. So yeah, I had a few months where I flirted with guns, but real frankly, my goal was to finish the book I was on. Okay, so in March, you are doing research at that point. I could be, yes. And uh, can we go ahead and put up State's Exhibit 82? Sure. Go there to March 26th, 10.13 a.m. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Searching, loading a 9 millimeter Glock. Okay. Uh, immediately after that, searching, cleaning a Glock. Okay. And then you get in your car. Okay. Drive out to an area that has now been established as where that Wolf Creek gun range is. I don't know why I put this back on. Uh, okay, but if I was, I can guarantee you that I wouldn't have gone that far. And the reason why is because that's all forested land and it's higher elevation than what Dan wanted. But I'm not going to tell you I wasn't out there because I probably was. You know, you've got video that shows my phone visited it. And you're out there for no time at all. Turn, basically turn around and drive straight back into Northeast Portland for lunch. That could be. Okay. It, it could be that uh, uh, that could have happened. I drive a lot in my job. I also drive a lot for meditation, for work, for writing. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? You're saying you drove around two random days in March. I'm saying my best guess is I was looking for property, but my best guess could have been I was still filling the plot hole too. Are you following me? Then I don't know what I was doing. I'm giving you what I regard as Po great possibilities of what I was doing. Great. So you have a nice lunch. You go home. Mm -hmm. The next morning, you get up and do the same thing. Okay. Dan's at work again. Okay. You drive out to the same area, mm -hmm. exact same area, mm -hmm. but you're there for longer. Do you recall that? I recall the testimony that I've heard. I'm asking if you recall. No. I No. These are two random. I drive all the time. I don't think about this. I drive when I'm thinking for about the story. I drive when I'm working. I work all over this whole area. No, I don't recall two random days in March that I was driving around. I can tell you for sure I never went to the gun range. Would it surprise you that that's the only two times that your phone, as far back as the phone records go, that we have, when you head out that way, that it's the only time you don't go all the way to the coast? No. That can't possibly be true. And the reason why that can't possibly be true is because I have a lot of clients in uh, Vernonia, and I would have gone out to see them, if nothing else, during Medicare uh, season. You know, I have clients I drive all over. I love Vernonia. I think it is a charming little town. But... Uh, but that does not mean that I that could possibly have been the only times I was out there that I didn't go to the coast. Do you agree on the 26th and 27th you didn't go to Vernonia? I don't remember going to Vernonia, but your records show that I didn't go to Vernonia, and I'm ready. I'm willing to believe you. Okay. I want to talk about. Uh, Dan's routines. Okay. We've got a lot of testimony in this case. I think you'd agree that he held a pretty strict routine. Is that correct? Yes. When it, whatever it was, whether it was what time he left for work or... Depending um, on the day. He sure. he held a strict routine depending on what his, his schedule was for the day. I think you testified that within a 30-minute window, is pretty much he got up at the same time every day. Didn't mm -hmm. matter if he was going to work. That's absolutely true. Um, what time was that? It was between 4 and 4.30. That's when he would wake up? Mm-hmm. Okay. And he, I think you testified too, and I, I know you told the police that he walked the dogs, mm -hmm. take care of the chickens, mm -hmm. um, sometimes go get you coffee. Mm -hmm. That was pretty routine for him. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? <clears throat> he frequently, if he needed to do something like go to Wojimaya in the morning, he would do that. Uh, he did shopping for his class or for whatever he was doing, uh, usually early in the morning. Okay. Uh, 
you know, he uh, he worked in the garden early in the morning. It sounds like you two kind of did your own thing during the day. Like he would go to work, you had your things, sorry, your things to do. Like you would have go and meet clients, things like that. But you didn't you didn't work together. That's not true. We frequently worked together. Uh, you worked at OCI? No, no, but we worked together on different things. If he had a class outside of OCI, for example, I might take things down to him. I took things down to OCI for Dan three to four times a month because he would get to school and realize he had left something. So we worked together in terms of, of doing things, but not necessarily on projects. Right. Am I being clear? Not really. Okay. Uh, so when you... Would you say that generally you knew where Dan was? Yes. I, yes, I and, would say that. And in general, would he know where you were? In general, he would know where I was. You guys would communicate, I'm, I'm going to work or I'm coming home or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or, you know, uh, uh, I sold a policy or uh, uh, the dogs uh, are having an issue or whatever. We, con we were in constant contact. Okay. And in general, I know it depends on what kind of stuff is happening at OCI. On the weekends, did Dan generally leave around the same time? In general, did Dan leave around the same time every day? No, it would depend on what his schedule was. You know, if he was working weekends, he worked, he worked, he left at a different time. If he was working days, he worked at a different time. If he was going mushroom hunting, he left at a different right. time. Listen to the question. The question okay. is, on the weekends, All right. when going to OCI, right. did he generally leave at the same time? I, I would say within a 30-minute window, yeah. Okay. And on June 2nd, mm -hmm. did you expect for him to leave earlier that day because of the live fire? It wouldn't have surprised me for him to, but Dan was always prepared. Dan took being a Boy Scout to heart. And he was always prepared. Yeah. Uh, we went to a party where somebody cut themselves with a knife. Who had a medical kit? Dan. You know, he was Mr. Prepared. So he could have left earlier. He could have been well enough prepared that he uh, didn't need to. And in preparation for that live fire, he actually took two carts down to the school the day before, correct? That wasn't in preparation for the live fire. He took two. Oh, just, okay. He took two carts down because he does that every weekend. Gotcha. He does that every Friday? Yes. Okay. Most Well, I hate to commit to every Friday. He does it every weekend, but the days he chooses to do it are his days. And uh, you were aware that he did that that Friday, June 1st? I was. Okay. And you know Dan generally parks on 17th in front of the Culinary Institute? No. He, I think he parks there a fair amount, but he also parks on Madison. He uh, rarely uses a lot because he's one of the lucky people who have a parking sticker. Right. Uh, he can park on the street. Yeah, yeah, and he parks wherever he parks. I mean, I don't think he has assigned parking or even a, his idea of assigned parking. Does it make sense to you, though, that when he is bringing things to the school that he would park on 17th so that he could unload and load into the school? That would make sense. But I would also say when he and the Starbucks across the street were doing five-gallon buckets of, of, uh, of coffee grounds, he parked on uh, Jefferson so he could deal with that. Okay. Uh, you stated that uh, you knew that the doors would usually be locked. <coughs> Is that true? The doors were always locked. As far as I know, I don't know of an incident where uh, anything but the student door would have been opened uh, that people could have gone in and out. Uh, we'll talk about the school in a little bit more in okay. just a second. Um, you sort of mentioned this. I actually think you did mention it, that Dan always had cash. Mm -hmm. Is that just kind of the guy he was? He liked to deal in cash as opposed to cards and credit cards? He operated with cash, and so he needed a lot of ones because of the cart. So he frequently would have uh, little 
money bundles of ones at home from either money he'd made off the cart or what have you. He operated with cash more, but it was largely for the cart. Right. And it's true that he often didn't even know how much money was in his own account, right? Dan was more routine than that. I wouldn't say he didn't know how much was in his account. I would say it differently. I would say Dan had certain the reason why we broke up our finances the way we did was because his expenses were much more routine and he could figure out his money based upon the fact his check was much more routine than my life was. Right. But he would actually reach out to you to ask you if his check had been deposited, right? Yes. He uh, Occasionally he would call me and say, uh, I need you to look at the bank account and tell me this or that. Your Honor, I'm about to start a new subject. I don't know if you want to. All right, let's go ahead and take our morning break then and be back on the record at 1045. <laughs>